Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That was a quote that was hanging on a plaque on the wall of my childhood home growing up. And you know, I, I didn't think much of it back then. As I was laying on the couch as a high schooler watching TV, I would look at it and think it's a great phrase and it's a great Christian saying, but didn't think much about it back then. And yet, that phrase is the essence and summary of the text that we'll be in today in 2 Peter chapter 3. And so, as you're watching online, I encourage you to grab a Bible or open your Bible app and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 today. So, Peter begins in verse 10 by talking about the day of the Lord. And Peter says this in verse 10 of chapter 3. He says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Now, when Peter uses this term, day of the Lord, he, he's actually speaking about something that's deeply rooted in the Old Testament. The day of the Lord, or the day of Yahweh, as it was known in the Old Testament, is documented many times and spoken about many times throughout the Old Testament in the prophets. Now, Peter's description of the day of the Lord in 2 Peter 3 actually alludes to some of these passages, passages kind of like Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, which says, Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Or Zephaniah 1, 14 through 18, a day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness, neither silver nor gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. And even Isaiah 13, 10 through 13, which says, Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. So just in hearing a few of these Old Testament prophetic passages speaking about the coming of the Lord and looking at our passage this morning in verse 10, you can see that Peter is using this Old Testament prophetic language to describe the second coming of Christ because that's what he knows from the Old Testament. But you know what's interesting when you look at verse 10 is that it's a pretty short description of the day of the Lord. Peter doesn't give an exhaustive doctrine on the end times, and that may seem interesting and curious to us until we realize the context in which Peter is writing. Remember right before verse 10 here in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, remember Peter talking about the false teachers, the false teachers would go around and teach the people, you know, Christ really isn't going to return. The world's just going to keep spinning. It's going to keep going. And so just live lives however you want to live because Christ actually isn't coming back to judge the world. What Peter's emphasizing here in this short statement about the coming of the Lord is that the coming of the Lord will in fact come and everything will in fact be burned away. Jesus will come again and we'll be left with nothing from this world. I also think it's important for us to understand the emphasis of not only this text that we have today, but also in all of First and Second Peter. I believe that the emphasis of these books isn't how Christ will return, but Peter is looking at that the reality that Christ will return one day and how that should impact our lives in preparation for Christ's return. And I think once we get that into our lens, as we look at 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and, and especially our text this morning, we'll see Peter's heart behind what he is writing to us. 
But before we get to that emphasis of how our lives should align with Christ's in preparation for his return, I just want to point out a few things from this 10th verse that Peter talks about the day of the Lord. And the first thing that Peter describes with the day of the Lord is that it'll come like a thief. The description of how Christ will come as a thief wouldn't, wouldn't have been a surprise, really, for the original hearers, and it shouldn't be for us either. Jesus actually talks about his coming as being like a thief. And you can tell from Jesus' teachings throughout the Gospels that Peter was sitting right at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus' teachings. And you know, it's interesting because in Matthew chapter 24, which is a chapter full of Jesus teaching about the nature of his second coming, in Matthew 24, about the timeline of Jesus' return, Jesus essentially says, I don't know. I don't know. Matthew chapter 24, 36 says this. After Jesus talked about other important details about the end times, he says this, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that Jesus, who is the person who will be coming back, and and we know that because Jesus is telling us that he is the person coming back. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't even know the day that he is returning? You'd think he would know that. But what Peter describes for us in our passage today is that the day of the Lord will come like a thief, essentially reiterating what Jesus taught Peter, that nobody except God the Father knows the day or the hour. Now, I'll get back to this a little later today, but it does beg the question for us this morning that if Peter and Jesus, if, if both of them tell us that the day and the hour are unknown of Christ's return, how, if at all, should that affect the way that we live our lives? Just something for us to think about today. What's also interesting to know about Peter's description about the coming of the Lord is that out of the descriptors that he gives in verse 10, only one is given about the timetable of Christ's return, like we just talked about, about being like a thief. And so while Christ's return is mostly unknown, Peter gives ample descriptors of the impact of the day of the Lord. Take a look at verse 10 again. Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. There's a timetable. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So the second thing to note about the day of the Lord is that not only will it come at a time when we least expect it, but it will come with a roar of destruction. This description in verse 10 is the, uh, about the coming of the Lord is just so fascinating to me, and it's pretty sobering to me as well. Peter, th- throughout his writings in First and Second Peter, is fairly poetic and artistic in the way that he writes these letters, and I hope that we'll see what the original hearers would have saw, because we have to remember that these New Testament letters, when they were circulated, they were actually read out loud to the people. And so somebody would come in into the center of a town or a village or at a service, and they would read aloud these these letters. And so the language that Peter uses is really important. Now, Peter uses two words in this 10th verse that only appear one time in the entire New Testament. And both are describing the coming of the Lord. And the first word is the word roar in verse 10. When, when, when Peter tells us that on the day of the Lord, the heavens will pass away with a roar. Now, that Greek word is pronounced hroidzidon. Hroidzidon. Now, I say that word aloud not, not to sound really smart or scholarly, But again, because New Testament letters were read out loud to the original hearers, that would have given special emphasis on that word because that word hroidzidon is an automatopoeia. Now, for some of you watching who are trying to remember back to your 10th grade English class about what automatopoeia means, 
An onomatopoeia is the formation of a word from a sound associated with what it's named. And so this word freudzidon means to rush or to whiz or to crash. So imagine an arrow flying through the air or a javelin flying through the air and that whooshing sound as it goes past your ear. That's what that word is formed after. Other ancient scholars have compared it to the crackling sound of a raging forest fire or even the crashing down of buildings. And so this idea of the heavens passing away with a roar is Peter artistically showing us the intensity in which the heavens will pass away. The second word that Peter uses here in verse 10 that that only appears once in the New Testament was a word that was known only in the medical community. After Peter says that the heavens will pass away with a roar, he goes on to say that the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. The word burned up, which Peter uses again in verse 12, was, was used by Greek physicians to describe the burning heat of a fever in someone's body. So not only will the heavens pass away with this intense roar, but the intensity of the heat will be such that the heavenly matter that we know will melt away and be destroyed. Just stop and think about that for a second. Everything that you see, the trees when you look outside that we can touch and that we can climb in, all the way to when you go outside tonight and look up in the sky and see the heavenly expanses, all of the stars and the moon and the planets and the galaxies, everything that we can see and touch, even the things that seem so unreachable to humanity like the moon, will pass away with roaring intensity and intense heat that will consume it and melt it. Which brings me to the last descriptor of the day of the Lord, which is that on that day, all will be exposed. You know, in the culture that we live in today with social media and technology that we possess, it's really easy for us to put our best foot forward every minute, every hour of every single day. Maybe you look at Facebook or Instagram and you see someone's life is just completely perfect. The kitchen is always clean. The kids always have smiles on their faces. This person's hair is always perfect. And and it looks like every time you see them on social media, they're having so much fun. Their family is just having the time of their life every time you see them. Well, if you haven't figured it out yet, let me burst your bubble today. That's not always the case with them. Our lives aren't perfect. The kitchen isn't always clean. The kids aren't always perfect little angels. And life isn't perfect. But it's so easy for us today, even without social media, even with just texting or even in short conversations with others, it's so easy for us to want to put our best foot forward to only show what we want other people to see. But the sobering reality of the day of the Lord and the coming of the Lord is that there will be no best foot forward. Peter says in verse 10 that after the heavens are burned away with a roaring intensity, that the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. The word for exposed that Peter uses here is the word eurisco, where where we get our English word eureka from. Everything will be exposed or exposed found out on the day of the Lord. So no matter who you are, we can pretend that everything's perfect, but on the day of the Lord, everything in our lives will be exposed. I know so far this message has sounded kind of depressing, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't trying to tell you what Peter is actually saying, what will happen in the day of the Lord. But there is hope in the midst of this today, and I hope that you catch it. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, you can actually read verse 10 and have hopeful anticipation for the coming of Christ. You can 
hope for Christ's coming. And even though everything will be exposed, even though everything will melt away with a roaring intensity, we can have hope because our King is returning and we will be united with him. But for those who aren't followers of Jesus, it's a different story. And my prayer is that today, whoever's watching this, if in your heart of hearts you know that you don't have that relationship with Jesus, that personal relationship where he's not the Lord of your life, my prayer is that you would make that commitment today. There's no membership fee. There's no price you have to pay. There's no paperwork you have to fill out for it. It's a relationship. It's going to God and saying, God, I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. I have done things that I'm not proud of. I, I know that I have disobeyed you and, and I want to start new. And it's just praying, asking Jesus to be the Lord of your life. It's that simple. And my prayer is that you would make that commitment and my prayer is that you would tell somebody about that because not only is it the most joy-filled decision you can make because it's not just an insurance policy to keep you out of hell, but it's a joy-filled, intimate relationship you can have with the God of the universe who loves you with everything that he is. So my prayer is that if you make that decision today to follow Jesus, that you would tell somebody, even just email myself or other members of our staff at Woodcrest and just tell us that you've made that decision. We would love to celebrate you, to give you whatever resources you need to begin that journey of faith. So going back to what Peter says in this emphasis of the coming of the Lord. Peter talks about the destruction that will come. But then he continues in our passage this morning in chapter 3, in verses 11 through 14, with a challenge and responsibility for us as followers of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, follow along with me in verses 11 through 14 of 2 Peter 3. Peter says, Since all these things, meaning the heavens and the earth, are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. These verses right here, friends, are of utmost importance for us as followers of Jesus. I would go so far to say that it's passages like this that we can see as purpose statements for our lives as followers of Jesus. Just think about this passage as a whole with me. Verses 10 through 14. Peter begins by talking about how the coming of the Lord will be intense with a roar of destruction and will melt away the heavens and the earth and everything will be exposed. And then Peter continues in verses 11 through 14 saying, essentially, so if that's the case, then how are we to live our lives as followers of Jesus? And so with that, I want to ask us three questions based on these three verses. And the first question I want us to consider is, what is the purpose of my life? Now, I know that that question may sound really general, but I believe Peter's making a purpose statement here in verse 11. Look at it again with me. He again says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of of the day of God. So we're waiting here on earth. The, this series has been called While We Wait, and the First Peter series has been called Sojourners because we're just traveling through this earth waiting for our life in Christ to begin. But this word waiting that Peter uses isn't a passive waiting that we see because Today, when we think about waiting, we think about going to the doctor or going to the dentist or bringing our car in to the mechanic and we sit in the waiting room. And what we do when we sit in the waiting room is we just try to pass the time. We twiddle our thumbs. We 
pick our nails, we look at our phone, we, we read a book, we do whatever will pass the time away. But the word that Peter uses here in these three verses, which actually he uses three times in our passage today, is an active word. That word for waiting can actually be translated as waiting anxiously or to look for or to expect. So think about the question again with that context of an active waiting. What is the purpose of your life? Is our purpose focused on the things of this world? Or is it focused on the coming of Christ? Because unfortunately, it's possible for us to be followers of Jesus and yet to live a life that looks like we have no purpose. It's possible for us to be Christians and yet when the, when the world looks at our lives, it may look like we have no purpose at all. So does our purpose lie on, in the things of this earth or does it lie on the future hope that we have in Christ coming again? You know, our world today, much like Pastor Pete has mentioned in the past few weeks of Second Peter, wants to indulge in the sensuality and the greed and the power that the world has to offer. The world around us wants to eat and drink and be merry. But what Peter is saying to us here is that we are to anxiously wait for the coming of the Lord. We're to live lives of holiness and godliness as we eagerly and anxiously await the coming of our King. And I've been so guilty of this, but it's so easy for us to get caught up in the day-to-day grind and busyness of our lives that sometimes we just don't even think about the coming of the Lord. We have this amazing hope that is laid out through the entire narrative of Scripture, and yet there's some, some days, even going on weeks or months, that we never even think about this future hope that we have in Christ coming again. Which brings us to our second question this morning. And that question is, what am I clinging to in this life? What am I clinging to in this life? And, you know, I've been so convicted over this question from these verses in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12 this week. You know, there's a sense of urgency when Peter is writing these verses. We don't know how much longer we have on this earth before either we die or before Christ comes again. So in addition to the question, what is my purpose? We must ask ourselves, what am I clinging to in this life? When you go throughout your day, is is your goal to glorify God in everything that you do? As I thought about this question as I was writing this message this week, I was so convicted about how much time I spend each week wasting time worrying and thinking about things that really in the grand scheme of everything really don't matter. Oftentimes, I'm clinging to what other people may think about me rather than clinging to God's view of who I am. I'm clinging to the accomplishments that that I can do on this earth instead of clinging to Jesus' death and resurrection as my true and sole identity. Maybe you're watching today and you're clinging to material things in your life. Maybe your life is built on houses and cabins and portfolios. Maybe you're clinging to your past that you're not proud of but it's limiting you or prohibiting you from turning to Jesus for grace and mercy. Maybe you're clinging to sin in your life, a habit or sin in your life that is not allowing you to look to Jesus. And maybe you're clinging to that instead of clinging to God as your provider. I don't know what you're clinging to in this life, but my prayer is that you would cling to Jesus Christ as your cornerstone. Because that truly is the only foundation that won't get washed away. Imagine with me for a second that you are up on the beach at Lake Superior. Now imagine that you're walking up the shores and you're collecting rare Lake Superior agates. And you're, 
You're going all along the beach. You're searching as much as you can. You're not eating. You're not drinking. You're not sleeping. You are fully consumed with collecting these agates and washing them off and then putting them in a pile next to you on the beach. Now imagine that a big wave comes from Lake Superior and crashes onto the beach and onto your pile of agates. What's going to happen? Well, most likely your pile of agates are going to get washed away. Now, it's a silly analogy, but I believe it can paint at least a little picture of what this life here on earth is like. We can stockpile all the things of the world, all the treasures of the world. We can enjoy them to the nth degree, and yet there's going to be one day where we're going to die or Christ is going to come. And all of those things that we are accumulating are going to be taken away. They're going to be melted away. They're going to crash with a roaring intensity. And we're going to be left with ourselves standing before God. Which brings me to my last question today, which is Christ is going to return. Will you be ready? Will you be ready? Peter gives us a blueprint in our passage this morning about how we can prepare for the coming of Christ again. And that blueprint is live lives of holiness and godliness. Notice how Peter doesn't say perfection and legalism. Peter never says do everything perfectly because God won't accept you unless you do that. No, Peter says live lives of holiness and godliness and eagerly await and hasten the coming of the Lord. Do you know why Peter, right after verse 10, he talks about the coming of the Lord. Do you know why some of the first words after that 10th verse speak to us about living lives of holiness and godliness? It's because those are the things that are going to pass into eternity. We can accumulate all the things on this earth and all those things are going to melt away. And yet the things that we do for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God, those will pass into eternity. And that's Peter's challenge for us today. Is how are we preparing our hearts, our minds, how are we living our lives for the future kingdom? And that's my prayer for you today and for me today. Because the saying is true. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for your word. And God, I thank you for the, the hope that we have that you are going to come again. And as followers of Jesus, we can rejoice in the coming of our King of Kings, that we can be united with you again. And God, I thank you for that hope that we have. And Lord, my prayer is that if there's anybody watching this morning that doesn't have that hope, that doesn't have that joy or that peace of knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, my prayer is that they would make that decision right now in the quietness of their heart. God, my prayer is that they would just confess to you that they aren't perfect, that they're sinners, and that they need you to be the one and only Lord of their lives. And God, I pray that as followers of Jesus today, that we would have that hopeful anticipation for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.